بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Picking up where we left off, we are in the fourth chapter. We are going to now talk about the particular applicability. In the last class, we talked about the general, العام. Now we are going to talk about الخاص. So, yeah, let's pick up where we say. So, قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين آمين. Particularization or تخصيص is distinguishing part of the sentence or removing it. For example, removing those who had a pact from his statement fight the polytheists. So in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, فَقَاتِلُوا مُشْرِكِينَ Fight the polytheists. All of the polytheists? No, because there are some of the polytheists that had an ahd, that had a, a pact with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have removed from that those people in which there was a, 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 a pact, a peace, a peace pact. Now this example, for example, this if we look at the modern world and look at the crazy Muslims that are killing people, you know, this is something that they don't understand. Yani there is something called uh, a pact or a peace with the, the Prophet said the Muslims and Muslim on the him that we abide by our uh, conditions and our pacts. So this is an example in which something has been removed, and therefore we have done taqsis of that verse. Phrases for declaring something particular are divided into connected or disjointed. So either there is something that is connected directly to it or there is something that is separated out of it. Connected particularization includes exceptions. And he says that this will come later. Conditionals, number two, conditionals, such as honor Beni Tamim if they come to you. Meaning it's a condition if they come. So what happens if Beni Tamim, Benu Tamim doesn't come, then there's no honoring of them. So there's a condition, there's a shart here. وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ Fight those who fight you. So there's a condition to fighting, for example. It's not just fight and that's it forever. When somebody's attacking you, then you repel that by force, if needs be. And then number three, qualification using an attribute. For example, honor the legists or the jurists of Bani uh, Tamim. So don't honor all of Bani Tamim all of the tribe, just those who are the fuqaha amongst them. So you have qualified it with an attribute. So those are just basic kinds of uh, taqsis. <clears throat> okay, we also have something called al-istithna or accepting. Accepting is removing something that otherwise would have been included in the phrase. So for example, the group came except Zaid. Accepting is valid only with the condition that something remains from that which the exclusion is being made. So example, I owe him 10 dinars except 9. So 10 minus 9 is 1, so you have 1 remaining, so that would work. But if you were to say, excluding 10, I owe you 10 except 10, it would be invalid and you would revert to the 10. Huh? So you have to be careful when you say that. One of its conditions is that it be linked to the phrase. So it would not be valid if we're one to say the jurists came and then a day later you say except Zaid because that day separation of time and you, you've, you've breached it. So you have to say it like in the same breath as we say in English or in the same moment uh, as we speak. It is permissible to put that which is excluded before that from which is excluded. So you could say except Zaid, no one stood. And that also works uh, in the English language. And it is permissible to exclude from the same category as was mentioned above and from other things. So you could say the people came excluding the donkeys, meaning that usually people would be traveling with donkeys. So you could say it could be a way of you saying they all came, but the donkeys, they didn't bring donkeys. That would also be acceptable. And then conditionals that have exclusions are permitted to precede that which is stipulated. 
So you could say, if Bani Tamim came to you, honor them. So all of these are types of speech that we use in everyday speech of how we do taqsis or how we can make something specific or particular. So when we go back to the Quran and Sunnah, another layer of our understanding is we have to make sure that we understand uh, you know, if something has been made specific. A lot of the things that people misunderstand in the modern world from amongst the Muslims, uh, I meaning a lot of what Muslims misunderstand in the modern world is because they don't understand that there's a difference between general and particular parts of speech. When something is qualified by an attribute, the unqualified is interpreted as being si similarly qualified, such as a slave qualified by belief in some places. Thus, the unqualified is interpreted as agreeing with the qualified as a pre precautionary measure. Okay. Let me, let me just state this in an easier way. Uh, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a kafara, as a way of expiating for certain sins, that we free a slave. وَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةً Some, some, uh, some places in the Qur'an, it just says free a slave. Other places in the Qur'an, when Allah ta'ala talks about freeing a slave, excuse me, Allah says free Raqaba mu'mina, a believing slave. So he's saying if in some places the thing is qualified and in other places it's not qualified, we will take that qualification and apply it to all of the references from the point of view of being cautious. We have to be cautious. So here all the references to the expiation of the slave would be a freeing, uh, freeing a believing slave. That's the example that he's given. <clears throat> it is possible for the Qur'an to be rendered particular by the Qur'an. So the Qur'an can make taqsis of itself. So do not marry idolatrous women, which was restricted by, and the virtuous women of those who received the book before you are, are lawful for you. So when Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ do not marry women who are idolatrous. There is an exception that we can marry people of the book. So here, the Qur'an is particularizing uh, uh, itself. The Qur'an can also become particular by the Sunnah. So for example, Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, God thus uh, commands you concerning the division of your wealth. يُسِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad which is that verse on face value, on its prima facie media, uh, reading, includes children of, uh, uh, of, disbeliever, of the disbelievers. However, the children of the disbelievers is excluded by the hadith. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Excuse me, I have the sniffles today. It's, it's sorry, it's particularized by the hadith that's in Bukhari and Muslim, Muslims do not pass inheritance to non-Muslims and non-Muslims to Muslims. So, that verse of inheritance on face value would include non-believing children or Muslims inheriting from non-believing parents. But there is a taqsis of that, there is a particularization of that found in the sunnah. Number three, the sunnah can be rendered particular by the Qur'an. So example, we have the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ says, God does not accept prayer from any of you when they lose ritual purity until they make ablution. This is in Bukhari Muslim. It's excluded by, and if you are sick or ill and you cannot find water, then clean earth, the verse of tayammum. So the verse of the tayammum will come to this hadith and it will make this hadith rather than general, particular. Even if the sunnah also mentioned dry ablution after the verse was revealed. <clears throat> Number four, the sunnah to be rendered particular by the sunnah. So the sunnah can, can particularize itself. We have example of a hadith, a zakah of one-tenth from anything irrigated by the sky. If, if you own land, 
and natural water irrigates that land, you have to pay one-tenth of the crops of that for zakah. But we have another hadith that says there is no zakah in anything less than five awsuq. So you have to, there's a minimal, what is called a nisab, the minimal zakatable amount is five awsuq, which is a sharia measurement. So if your land produces less than that, you're not going to pay that zakat. So here the sunnah has made particular the sunnah. And then number five, he says, <clears throat> utterances to be rendered particular by qiyas, analogous reasoning. By utterances, we mean the words of Allah Ta'ala and the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam. This argument is that qiyas or analogical, analogical, analogical reasoning rests upon a text from the Quran and Sunnah. So it is as though the text performs the exclusion. In other words, if we argue that In other words, it argues that if we say that Qiyas can particularize the Qur'an and Sunnah, it doesn't mean that we as humans in our reason are particularizing the Qur'an and Sunnah, but we are using our thinking apparatus to find similar statements in the Qur'an and the Sunnah that will make particular other places. That's what he's talking about. Chapter 5. Al-Mujmal wal-Mubayyan wal-Zahir wal-Mu'awwal Ambiguity and clarification Ambiguity, Al-Mujmal, is that which needs clarification So example, in, in the uh, verse of the women's monthly cycle uh, In the verse of the idda of the waiting period after the divorce Allah Ta'ala says that the woman has to wait thalatha quru three that's not ambiguous. Al-Qar, that's ambiguous because Al-Qar in the Arabic language can either mean the duration of the period, the menstrual cycle, or the duration of the clean period after the menstrual cycle. So, menstrual cycle. So that word Al-Qar in the Arabic language, it has both meanings, which is why Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam al-Shafi have different opinions about which one it means. So therefore, that is ambiguous. That word is ambiguous. We don't deny three, but we don't necessarily know is it this or that. Clarification is taking something from the realm of ambiguity into the realm of being evident. Something clear is mubayyin, is called unequivocal and nas. So, now you can see that when you read the Qur'an and Sunnah, there are a lot of things that are ambiguous. We, we, there are a lot of things that require a little bit more of effort from the mujtahid to understand exactly what does this mean, and then therefore you can understand why there are different opinions. One of the reasons why there are different opinions. And nas when we say an nas that means it's a clear, unequivocal text. وَأَقِيمُ salah Establish the prayer. You, no thinking is required. We know what that means. The unequivocal or the nas is that which cannot be interpreted except as having one single meaning. So, for example, if I said I saw Zaid, it means I saw this guy that we all know called Zaid. There's no ambiguity. It doesn't mean I saw his mother. It doesn't mean that I saw his shadow. It doesn't mean that I saw his friend, it means I saw Zaid. That's an un unambiguous language. Or, a nas can also be a text whose interpretation is just as it was revealed. For example, fasting three days, since its meaning is understood just by it being revealed. So in some of the expiation in the Hajj, you have to fast three days. Fasting three days in the Hajj and seven when you return, that's a total of, of ten. Fasting three days means fasting three days. I mean, it's straightforward. You don't need to think about that. The Arabic technical term an-nas is derived from minasat al-urus, uh, which is a, pla a manasa or minasa is a, like a stage because it towers above everything else when it comes to understanding its meaning without considerable thought. So, thankfully, there are many aspects of the Qur'an and Sunnah that are just a nas, it's just a clear text, you don't have to think about it. But there are some things 
that are <clears throat> ambiguous, that requires supporting evidence, supporting, you know, intellectual efforts to make clear. Now, uh, evident, a zahir. Something that is evident, a zahir, is that which can be interpreted in two ways, where one interpretation is more likely or more preponderant than the other. So example, the word lion in the phrase, I saw a lion, since it probably means the predatory animal, as this is the literal meaning, and interpretable to be, mean a brave man instead. The example that I like to give is an ocean. You walk into the mosque, you attend a class, you come home, your friends ask you, how was the class? And you said, oh, I saw an ocean in the mosque today. Well, obviously, you didn't see the actual ocean. You're referring to the person and describing it. But if we're with friends and you said, you know, last week I saw the ocean, we all assume that means you saw the ocean, we did not that there's some, some, something else. That's called a zahir, that there are just some things in the way we speak that are evident. And if we didn't have this, we would not be able to communicate with one another. So this is as important as all of this stuff is that we've been talking about. This is also just natural. I hope everyone is understanding that this is just the human condition. Imagine if we spoke to each other and we didn't understand every time, is, are you, did he really mean that or did he really mean that? We wouldn't be able to communicate. So language by definition, this is part of the, the package of human language, any language for that matter. When the phrase is interpreted as one meaning, it is called interpreted, that ta'wil. It is only done with the use of evidence, just as the author said. Evident, the zahir is interpreted, if this is evidence, it is called evident through evidence, a zahir bil dalil. It is also called interpreted al muawwal. So, when we have a statement or a phrase that could mean multiple things, but we choose one because we have proof of, of what it is, we call it ta'wil. The previous stuff we just talked about in the beginning of this chapter are things that don't require that. It, 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 thalatha. Thalatha means three. There, there's no other interpretation. It can't mean, it's not a symbol for something else. The botanies which is a sect of Islam in the early part, they have this problem where they just thought everything meant something else. And that's why they didn't last, because how can you, how can you follow a religion if, if everything that is said means really something else that's magical, and only this one special person that's hiding in a cave can interpret it for you? I mean, what kind of religion is that? It doesn't work. So here we are talking about things that actually can have multiple meanings. Um, for example, he gives... And the sky, we built the heaven with our hands. <clears throat> its apparent meaning is the plural of hand, yad. So the singular is yad here. Ayadi is hands. So Allah Ta'ala uses the plural in this verse. But this is impossible with respect to Allah Ta'ala. So it is diverted to mean might, quwa, with clear, sure, rational evidence. So... In this verse, now this is a theological uh, component here that he's introduced. The, 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 the sky, Allah says, we created or we built it or constructed it with our hands. So does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has multiple hands? Any yani multiple hands? You know, astaghfirullah, that's, that's disbelief. Uh, uh, because Allah ta'ala has no form. Laysa kamithlihi shay. So therefore, that interpretation of that verse, it cannot mean that. It's impossible. It's impossible rationally and theologically that that's what it means. Therefore, there must be another ta'wil, there must be another meaning to it, which is, we are going to say in this case, it's his strength. Because Allah Ta'ala is demonstrating that he is the khalaq, he is the creator. Chapter 6, Actions of the Prophet, which is basically the sunnah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The Prophet sallam, is referred to uh, as shari'a, the legislator, or the shari'a is also a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you find that reference in our intellectual history. So here he says the actions of the legislator, i.e. the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, 
are either in the manner of acts of worship and obedience or not. If they are in the manner of acts of worship and obedience, and there is evidence indicating it being particular to him, وسلم, then it is interpreted as being particular to him. For example, his, being, his, his marrying more than four women. So when we look to the Prophet Sunnah, وسلم, we have to remember that there are some things that are specific only to the Prophet. وسلم. Like this example, he had more than four wives at the same time. That's from his khasais, from his special traits. We cannot follow that. The Prophet وسلم, could see behind him like he could see in front of him. Uh, in front of him. Well, obviously, that's from his khasas. We can't do that. That's, so we can't say that that's the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ had to pray Qiyam al-Layl. Qiyam al-Layl was a fard. For the Prophet ﷺ, for us, it's a sunnah, etc. And there are books of the khasas, like a Suyuti's khasas, and Kubra, and Suhra, and other of the ulama have compiled those. If no evidence, now how do we know that that's the marrying more than four women is a is a khasas, of the Prophet because Allah says Mathna wa thulatha wa ruba in the Quran. So in he's capped the limit to four. So obviously, if we find the Prophet doing that, then obviously it's it's one of his uh specific traits. If no evidence indicates this, that it is particular to him, sallallahu alayhi wa then the action is not particular to him because the Quranic verse in the Messenger of God, you have a good example for him who's uh, who hopes in God and the last day and remembers God much. So that verse is a universal verse that we take, that we are to follow the sunnah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, unless and, un and, un and until we find something that would render it uh, something specific. <clears throat> the action is interpreted as being obligatory to some of the, our Shafi colleagues with respect to the Prophet ﷺ and us, since it is the most precautionary. Some of our colleagues say that the action is interpreted as being recommended, since this is what is clear from the established request. Some of our colleagues opined that one must withhold judgment since the relevant evidence is inconsistent. So, the verse, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Does that mean that the actions of the Prophet ﷺ that we have established are not specific to him? Does that mean that they're obligatory for us, and it's wajib, or it's sunnah? Khilaf, difference of opinion, but the majority will say, obviously, it's a sunnah, unless there's some kind of like evidentiary thing that shows us that it's a fault. These are, by the way, in regards to acts of worship. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed Salat al-Duha. The Prophet ﷺ prayed Salat al-Qiyam. The Prophet ﷺ prayed uh, the Sunnah uh, al-Rawatib, the, the Sunnah before the prayers and after the prayer. Does that mean yani, those prayers are fard or Sunnah? That's where the debate is. If the action is not in the manner of worship and obedience, then it is ter interpreted to be merely permissible. For example, eating and drinking with respect to the Prophet ﷺ and us. Now this is an important distinction because many modern Muslims for some reason they, they didn't get this memo when they were growing up. That when it comes to matters not of ibadah, then the things that the Prophet ﷺ did are sunnah. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, meaning the recommended, the Prophet ﷺ sat a certain way, dressed a certain way, uh, 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 ate a certain way, ate certain types of foods. And those are sunan. There's cool things to do, good things to do. You get rewarded for doing them, but they're not obligatory. Some Muslims, especially from super conservative backgrounds, for whatever reason, they take those sunnahs and they raise them to the level of haram and halal. So if they see people doing things different than that, for some reason, they criticize them. And you can't criticize somebody for not doing a sunnah. You can only criticize somebody for not for engaging in an openly agreed upon haram act. Other than that, everything is difference of opinion, so we don't have the right to criticize one another. The tacit approval, the iqrar of the Prophet ﷺ of a statement 
from any individual is the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. Just like his statement, it, it, meaning it is just like his statement and his endorsement of an action for any individual is just as his own action. This is because the Prophet ﷺ is divinely protected from tacitly approving someone doing something object, objectionable. If the Prophet ﷺ saw something that was haram, he would have to have said it's haram. Meaning, what he's saying here, if the Prophet ﷺ saw something and didn't say something or approved of it directly or tacitly, that means that that act is part of his sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Bilal, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Bilal, I saw you last night in my dream walking in paradise. What is the act that you do that Allah Ta'ala has given you this? And then Sayyidina Bilal thought and he said, every time I make wudu, I pray two rakas. Or every time I make wudu, more accurately, I pray as much as Allah allows me to pray. So that for, therefore Sayyidina Bilal established the sunnah of praying two rakas after you make wudu. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed him. Now, had that been a bid'ah in the negative sense or wrong, the Prophet ﷺ would have had to, our theology teaches, he would have had to have said that that's haram. The examples that uh, is in the book. This is his tacit approval of Sayyidina Abu Bakr anhu giving the belongings of a slain enemy combatant to his slayer. So if somebody is in a legitimate jihad and you kill the enemy, the person who killed that enemy can take their, the things of that person that they slayed. This was from the Ijtihad of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed that. And his approving of Khalid ibn Walid eating the desert iguana. Both of these are in Bukhari and Muslim. So a, a person made uh, an iguana for the Prophet Sallallahu And he asked, what is this? And then he said, oh, this is the iguana. And he said, I'm not used to eating this food. This was not the kind of food that I grew up with. And then Khalid is next to him, he's like, is that haram? And he's like, no, he's like, okay. And he, you know, he ate it. And so the Prophet allowed him to eat it, right? He didn't say anything. If it was haram, he would have said something. But rather he's saying, I'm not used to that. I don't think I can eat that. <laughs> Sometimes you're presented with foods that you're just like, yeah, I'm not used to it. And that's a natural thing. Okay. The ruling of things done while the Prophet والسلام, was alive, yet not in his presence, but he knew about and did not object is the same as something done in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, he knew وسلم, that Abu Bakr anhu swore an oath that he would not eat food for the duration of his anger and Abu Bakr then eating when he realized that eating was better for him just as is understood from the hadith concerning feeding. So this is something that Sidna Abu Bakr did outside of the purview of the Prophet ﷺ. He heard about it. And he, by hearing about it, as long as he didn't object, he affirmed it. Right? So there's much more elasticity in our practice of Islam than many people think. The next chapter is abrogation, nesh. Let me just pause to have a drink and see if there's any questions that people have while, uh, just for this brief, brief pause. <clears throat> okay. A nesh abrogation. Abrogation means that we have a text that tells us one thing, and then another text comes after it that tells us the opposite. So the new text has abrogated the old text. So the ruling was this, but now we can do this. <clears throat> the linguistic meaning of abrogation, nesh, is to efface. One says the sun effaced the shadow. So you know, like you have a shadow and then the sun appears and shoo, the shadow is gone. It's completely nesh, it's gone. When it removes it and erases it by its rising. It also, it is also said that it comes from to transfer, from the say, saying, I transferred was what was in the book. Uh, there used to be a job of people called a nusakh, a nasikh, or the plural of nusakh, or people that I want this book. It's not Amazon, you can't buy it. So you take this book to a nasikh, they will take it and they will copy it down for you and give you a copy. So that's also he meaning I transferred or I copied what was in the book when he transfers it in the manner in which it was written. Okay, so that's sort of what the word means linguistically. 
uh, its legal definition is a discourse, a khitab, the khitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the definition of al-hukm al-shari'i. A sharia ruling is the eternal uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed to the human being who is morally responsible to either do or not do a certain act. That's the technical definition of al-hukm al-shari'i. So al-khitab uh, is a like a euphemism for uh, al-hukm al-shari'i when you find it in the in the books of usul al-fiqh. So the next, it's a legal uh, sorry, Afwan. Its legal definition is a discourse indicating the subsequent repeal of a ruling established by a previous discourse in such a way that without which the ruling would remain established. This is the definition of abrogating. The definition for abrogation is taken from it, removing the mentioned ruling through a discourse that is removing the ruling's relationship to the actions. The phrase established by a discourse precludes the ruling established by the default ruling of innocence baraatul asliya the absence of being responsible for anything prior to evidence to the contrary what that's saying is that we have a belief in the sharia that there's something called al baraatul asliya how does he translate it the default ruling of innocence what is before Islam or before the revelation? Bara'atul asliya. People are, have a default ruling of innocence. Then comes Allah Ta'ala's speech, وَأَقِيمُ salah. Okay, now we have to pray. So does that وَأَقِيمُ salah means that we have abrogated the default innocence? He's saying that. In that case, it's not called nasr because there was no, the default is just the default. It's not like an established ruling. It's a technical thing. The phrase by a discourse, which is taken from the author's words, precludes the ruling re re being repealed by death and insanity. If a person becomes insane, they are no longer a morally responsible person. They no longer have taklif. So do you say that now they have nesq, they don't have to do the things they had to do before? He's saying no, because nesq can only come from the khitab of Allah Ta'ala, only from the speech, eternal, uncreated speech of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala basically through revelation. So he's one of the things that the usulis do that we learn from the science of logic is we try to construct the best definition for something. The best definition for something is jama mana. Jama it brings together all of the necessary parts and mana and it repels all of the unnecessary parts. So he part of what he's doing here, which is you know typical of how our sciences are written, is he's trying to show you the the the, the robustness of the definition. So uh, the it has to be as a khitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that moves or removes a ruling for it to be considered <clears throat> abrogation. The phrase in a manner or in such a way, etc., precludes a previous discourse that had set a limit or apparent cause. A cause in the Sharia is called an illa. Al illa is a direct Arabic equivalent to what we find in Latin, which is the source of Western law called the ratio legis. The ratio legis is the reason behind the law. Why is alcohol haram? Because it intoxicates. So intoxication is the reason behind consuming alcohol being haram. <clears throat> so if there's a ruling that has its ratio legis, its illa, and then the illa is not there anymore and the ruling is not there, we don't call that abrogation because that's just simply the absence of the, of the illa, of the ruling. For example, he gives in the Qur'an, when the call is heard for the prayer on Friday, when you hear the nida, the call for Friday prayer, rush to prayer and close down your businesses. Here the prohibition to sell is limited 
by completing the performance of Friday prayer with the with the salat of fantashiru fil ardi wa thkurullah kathiran. Allah says at the verse after, when the prayer is over, go ahead, spread out and do your business. And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's not an example of nasq, just there's a limit to the ruling. <clears throat> and when the prayer is ended, then disperse in the land and seek God's favor. Um, وَإِذَا قُلِتْ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَدْوِ وَبِتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ I misquoted the verse earlier. So he says, rather, the second clarifies the limit of the prohibition. So when you put both of those verses together, you realize that the prohibition for selling is limited to the duration of Salat al -Jumma. An example of having an apparent cause, illa, is that the Quranic verse, hunting game is forbidden to you while you are in the state of consecration. It is not to be abrogated by the verse, and when you remove the state of ihram, you can hunt. That's not abrogation, because he's showing you that there's a limit. What is the limit? is that the illa is now gone, that the illa, the cause, was the state of ihram. The state of ihram has been lifted, so therefore you can engage in the act. So he's like, this is not an example of, of nasr. Okay. The divisions of abrogation. It is possible for the written record to be abrogated when its ruling remains. Examples, uh, Omar radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu used to say that in the Qur'an it was revealed the married man and the married woman, if they commit adultery, lapidate them until death. As-shaykhu wa shaykha idha zaniya farjimuhuma al-batta. Omar radiallahu anhu said, verily we used to recite it, and al shafi and others narrated it, and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did lapidate married people, but that part of the Quranic revelation is not in the Mus'haf. So this is an example of the written record being abrogated, but the ruling, but that is the ruling for married people that commit adultery according to the procedures of our crime and punishment. I mean, the details, of course, are there. Number two, the ruling to be abrogated while its written record remains. Example, those of you who are about to die and leave behind wives, uh, leave a bequest to their wives a year's provision without causing them to leave their homes. In Surah Al-Baqarah, this is abrogated by widows shall wait, keeping themselves apart before they marry for a period of four months and ten days. Uh, so the second verse abrogates the first verse. However, the first verse is still in the Quran. And then you can have both the written and the record and its ruling to be abrogated. For example, the hadith of Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam, where she said the revelation included that 10 known nursings render certain relationships unlawful. Yani 10 nursing of from a woman would establish the nasab. This was abrogated by five nursings rendering the same unlawful. So neither is there a written record of the first and the, and the um, and the ruling was abrogated. Abrogation is divided into that which has a replacement and that which does not. The first is like facing Jerusalem during uh, prayer being abrogated by the Kaaba. So that's one Qibla was abrogated for another Qibla. The second will come like what is in the verse when you consult the messenger in private, alayhi give charity before such cons consultation.
وإذا ناجيتم الرسول بي... وإذا ناجيتم الرسول فقدموا بين يدينا جواكم صدقة. So that was abrogated and there's no replacement for that. Okay. Abrogation with a replacement is divided into strict or lenient. So something can become more strict or something can become more lenient. In something becoming more strict, choosing between fasting Ramadan and paying an expiation being abrogated by fasting being personally obligatory. And those of you who can afford it, there is a ransom, the feeding of a man in need, up to, therefore, wherever of you is present in that month, month, let him fast. So in the beginning, you had the option, and then later, there's no option, you have to fast. Or things can become easier, like in the verse of the Quran, if there, if there be of you 20 steadfast, they shall come over 200. And this is abrogated by the verse, if there be of you steadfast, 100, they shall overcome 200. And then lastly, he says, it is possible for the Qur'an to abrogate the Qur'an, what preceded in the two verses concerning the way, the Idda period, or the Qur'an to abrogate the Sunnah, what preceded concerning facing Jerusalem, and then uh, facing Mecca. Number three, the Sunnah can abrogate the Sunnah, the Hadith of the Prophet, I used to forbid you from visiting the graves, now visit them. The author did not mention the Sunnah abrogating the Qur'an. One opinion is that it is possible. An example of this was made with a verse, it is prescribed for you when one of you approaches death, if he leaves wealth, that he bequeath it, bequeath it to his parents and near relatives. This is abrogated by the Hadith, there is no bequest for inheritors in Tirmidhi. This is objected to, um, uh, to in that the Hadith is a solitary report, it's Ahad, which we'll talk about later. Um, it will come later that mass transmitted reports are not abrogated by solitary reports. However, that is more of an example of taqsis, not nesikh, because you can bequest up to one third. So if you put all of those traditions together, that would just be an example of taqsis. One copy of the basic text of Waraqat includes, it is not possible for the sunnah to abrogate the Qur'an, that is in contrast to particularization, taqsis, that's what I'm saying as preceded since particularity is of a less degree than abrogation. And then lastly, he says, it is possible for mass transmitted reports, mutawatir, to abrogate mass transmitted reports, and for solitary reports and mass transmitted reports to ab abrogate solitary reports. It is not possible for solitary reports to abrogate mass transmitted reports like the Qur'an, since solitary reports are inferior to it with respect to strength. However, the, the dominant position is that it is possible since the locus of abrogation is the ruling, not the text itself, and the verse's signification of that ruling conveyed through mass transmission is prob probabilistic, just like solitary. So there's a difference of opinion on that. Okay, I'm going to end here, but I do want to say something that's very important, uh, which is that uh, I want to comment on something in regards to abrogation. While what we read is in fact the dominant uh, standard way that in Sunni usul we talk about abrogation, there is a dissenting position in uh, the body of usul al-fiqh that there is no abrogation in the Qur'an. And this was advocated by um, Abu Muslim al-Asfahani, who was a Mu'tazilite, it was also advocated by Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, who obviously was a Sunni, and it was also made popular and really established in the modern period by uh, Sayyid Abdullah bin Sadiq al-Ghumari, the Sheikh of our Mashaykh, who died in the, in the early 90s in Tangiers. And Sheikh Abdullah bin Sadiq al-Ghumari, who was an Azhari, a Hafiz of Hadith, you know, very well-known uh, scholar, Moroccan scholar, uh, he has a book, uh, not that long of a book, but he has a book on the impossibility, the theological impossibility that the Qur'an contains within it. Nas. The reason I'm mentioning that is that this position is the position that is adopted today by most of the bodies of fatwa. What is the significance of this position? 
is that it means that there's no nasq in the Qur'an because the Qur'an is a book of guidance. It's a book of hidayah. And therefore, all of the verses in the Qur'an are books of guidance with the particular circumstances of every verse. The reason this is important is because the crazies, dash and, and whatnot, they say that the verses of coexistence and peaceful coexistence are abrogated by the verse of the sword. But if you understand this position, then you understand there is no abrogation. So therefore, when people are attacking your homeland and persecuting you, you have the right to defend yourself. But when they incline towards peace, then you incline towards peace as well. So therefore, it's not an issue of abrogation. It's an issue that each verse in the Qur'an has a particular context in which it can be applied. Furthermore, upon further investigation, there is no ijma whatsoever that any of the verses in the Qur'an that the ulama said were abrogated, were abrogated. In other words, they're all mukhtalaf fihi, they all have differences of opinion. So since there's no ijma about the verses of abrogation in the Qur'an, and because there is another opinion, we have found in the modern time that this opinion is more compatible with the modern condition. So we teach the book the way it is. We respect the turaf, the tradition, but at the same time we add that there is this nuanced uh, component to it that I just wanted to pass on to you guys. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Are there any questions before we end for today? Okay. So, see you tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.